Okay, greetings children, and welcome to Remote School once again. I know you're very excited to be with me here online. Um, what I want to do today is I want to talk about a couple of the Greek philosophers. And we started touching upon the idea of philosophy and all these different golden age ideals of the Greeks. The Greeks are going to provide new forms of drama and literature and art and architecture and the way they capture history uh, we looked at the Greek art last time, uh, how ancient Eastern art used to be so um, 2D, flat, garish colors, not a lot of anatomically correct detail. And then all of a sudden you have the Greeks and all of a sudden you have realism, you have three dimension, and you have a lot higher form of art than you had in previous incarnations. But the biggest gift, besides democracy, and we've already touched upon that quite a lot, is the idea of Greek philosophy. And the three philosophers we're going to visit uh, in our study of Greek philosophy are the, the big three, are the Trinity, and that is Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Now, over the weekend, you were to take a look at Socrates in this Cahill reading. Uh, as usual, I think it is really important um, to uh, take a little look at, at Cahill. He has such that great conversational style of writing that it makes it so much better uh, than a lot of the stuff you're going to have to read, frankly, in college. Uh, so I, I hope you did enjoy it. The first thing we know about Socrates are all the things that he wrote down for us. Of course, that's a trick question. Socrates wrote nothing down, ever, which kind of fits his personality. He just seems like a guy who, you know, he was garish, he was annoying, he was obnoxious, a gadfly, they called him. That's like the Greek version of a mosquito. It's a nuisance. And he writes nothing down for us. So everything we know about Socrates comes from his best student writing a generation later, and that's Plato. So we're kind of at the mercy of Plato here. He can make Socrates sound however he wanted. In the ancient world, it was not uncommon to pretend you were somebody else and write if you were someone else. Now today, if I wrote a letter to the editor and I said I was you know, Donald Trump, or I said I was Joe Biden, uh, that's, that's libel, I, I'm, I'm literally lying. I can go to jail for it. Um, in the ancient world, that was an accepted kind of play. You can sort of put yourself in the mindset of somebody else and write pretending you were them and everybody was just cool with it. Uh, just a different sort of mindset. Socrates, uh, to quote, to quote Cahill says, in Greek eyes, Socrates was a squat, ugly, barefoot man who did not bathe too often, was easy to spot shuffling through the agora, or passing time in his favorite hangout, the shop of Simon the Cobbler. Looking nothing like a god or hero, he had bulging eyes, a flat pug nose, prominent lips, and a pot belly. Now we know the Greeks were very obsessed with arete, greatness, and part of that was physical beauty. So the very fact that this guy is, you know, fat, ugly, and pug-nosed, and the Greeks still appreciated him, his arete, day, his genius was his mind, you know, it showed that he was something. Socrates' thing was he questioned literally everything. And he would always answer these questions with another question. Sometimes in teaching, we do something called Socratic circles. And that is when you as a teacher, you answer every question with a question. The hope is sort of leading the student to the answer. If you read through this, there is a dialogue between Socrates and this guy named Paul Marcus. Um, and this other guy, Paul Marcus, he says, morality lies in helping one's friends and harming one's enemies. And Socrates starts, he's, he's always nibbling. He's always kind of giving you these little, these little um, wisps of where he's going and making you find it. He says this, when you say friends, the, the, the line the other guy said was, morality lies in helping one's friends and harming one's enemies. He says, when you say friends, do you mean those who appear to be a person to be good or those who genuinely are good if they don't appear to be and likewise frenemies. And they go through all the way through and what he ends up showing him, and I'm gonna save you rereading the dialogue because it can get a little tedious. He shows him that you never can really tell who your friends and your enemies are. 
You never really can tell who is good and bad. It's so subjective. So he says, you're probably better off if you're moral. Just be good to everybody. And that way you don't have to worry about this sort of thing. And he gets the other guy to see it. Now, could it actually work out that way? I don't know. It's like everything else. It's a good story. It's a good style. But we don't know if that's the actual reality. Um, by the end of it, he says, is it not the job of a moral person then, Paul Marx, to harm a friend or to harm a friend or anyone else? It is the job of his opposite, an immoral person. He's saying only a bad person would actually harm people. So you don't want to do that. Socrates was kind of like a rock star in Athens. The kids loved him. And the reason they loved him is, is he was always speaking truth to power. He wasn't afraid to question the elders. He wasn't afraid to question the military leaders. He wasn't afraid to question those in power. And the young people liked it. And they flocked to this, you know, ugly old guy with the pot belly. He was their hero. Well, then Socrates took it a little too far because he started questioning the one institution in Athens that was unquestionable. He started questioning the gods. And with this, the Athenians said, we're done. Have this man arrested. And the charges will be corrupting the youth of Athens, making them question the gods too. So they brought Socrates for a trial. And Athens, as a democracy, every voting member of the public, they got to serve on the jury. And so they bring Socrates in and they question him as to what he as to what he has to say for himself to these charges of corrupting the youth of Athens. And how do you think Socrates answers? If you said with questions, you are correct. It was cute. It was cheeky. His followers loved it. And the Athenian jury said, if this is how you want to play it, if you're going to disrespect this body, if you're going to disrespect our gods, then you're going to pay for it with your life. And they sentenced Socrates to death. Now, Socrates could have gone out of this with an apology, but he refuses. The Athenians, remember, Athens is a democracy here. They allow him to pick the method he's going to die. And he, cho he chooses picking a poison called, uh, drinking a poison called hemlock. And so he has a big party with his friends. They feast, they drink, he gets in the bathtub. He says his goodbyes and he takes the hemlock and he dies right there. Now, one of the people who was incensed by the death of Socrates, that the fact that the democratic Athenians made him commit suicide was his best student. And that of course was, was Plato. And Plato is the one who records all of this for us. Plato is going to write a treatise on government called the Republic. And in it, he believed that democracy was not the answer. He essentially believed people were too dumb to govern themselves. Winston Churchill has two of my favorite quotes on democracy. Churchill, the great World War II leader of democratic Great Britain. He said, first of all, Democracy is the worst form of government, except every other form of government. He acknowledges the imperfection of democracy. And he talks about the people who actually run a democracy. Uh, Churchill also said the best argument against democracy is a five minute conversation with the average voter, saying the average person has no idea how to run a government. Imagine if Churchill was saying that in the 1940s. His head would probably explode in the social media era. Plato kind of echoed a little bit of Churchill's sentiments, but though Churchill truly believed in democracy, he just acknowledged his flaws. Plato believed democracy was dangerous because to Plato, democracy had done the unthinkable. It had put the most intelligent man he'd ever known, the smartest man he'd ever known, the greatest leader that Athens had ever produced, the Athenian democracy had put him to death. So they decided, Plato did, that democracy was an unfit form of government. 
the people were not smart enough. So how should you run things? Here's what he says. He says, it's easy. You're going to run it like this. At birth, we are going to have the state regulate children. We're going to let them live with their families for a little bit, like the Spartans do. But then at five, six, seven years old, we're going to pluck them away. And if you're an athlete, we'll take you to be a warrior. If you show skill in a trade, we'll teach you how to be a tradesman. And if you're brilliant, if you're that something special, if you're academically gifted, we're going to train you to be a philosopher. And the philosophers will run the government. They will be the philosopher kings. It's kind of self-serving, isn't it? This guy's a philosopher, and here he is saying the philosopher should run the show. Ironic. What do you do with everybody else? They're the farmers, the laborers. Make them work. It's a funny line. One of the Greek um, philosophers writes, he says that in this perfect environment, all will be equal, and we will have all, all that we, we need, and we will grow in wisdom and knowledge, purity and morality. And that second person goes, and who will grow all the food for us? And the first guy goes, oh, the slaves will do it. So obviously his republic is not quite as perfect as he would make you think it is. The point of it is, it sounds good, right? A few people on top controlling everything, well-trained, wise. But one person's wisdom might be another person's madness. One person's shrewdness might be another person's oppression. The Republic is very well-meaning, but there's a famous saying that says, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. Make no mistake, the Republic is a totalitarian state. And if you squint at it just right, you see the seeds of fascism. And for a guy who was burned by democracy, he may think it works, but there's a good chance it does not. And that the Republic ever came true. And let's be clear, no one ever tried to follow this. It's just Plato's philosophy. Probably wouldn't have worked out very well. Plato's other most famous work is the famous allegory at the cave. And it had to do with how we believed in reality. Plato's understanding of reality is already pretty strange. He believed in something called the world of the forms. And that's to say, okay, so I'm assuming you're watching me, you're sitting at a desk right now, or you're, you're sitting on a chair or on a bed or something, okay? Plato would say, okay, you think you're sitting on a chair? You're not actually sitting on the chair. You're sitting on like an echo of a chair, like a shadow of a chair. It's not really there. You think it's there, your senses are deceiving you. But somewhere out there, in the world of the forms, in the world of perfection, there is chair prime. And it is all that is chairliness. And that is the alpha chair to which all other chairs aspire and cannot reach that pinnacle. The world of the forms is out there. Later philosophers like Plato, we don't know where you were going with that on that one. But his understanding of reality and us only thinking we see reality leads us back to the cave. And the cave is his most famous allegory. What I'm going to do for you now is we'll make Plato and his greatest student, Aristotle, our story for another day. But you are going to watch the cave. And if you watch this video, I should be able to include it right in there. If the sound doesn't work, I'll send you the link. But you're going to watch this and you're going to go, after you're done watching, into Schoology. You'll answer about four or five multiple choice questions on the story I just told you. And you will answer one short answer question on the cave. Uh, it's in two parts. You'll have to answer part one, summarize what happened, just to brief, prove me, watch the video. Number two, what do you think that allegory means? What are these, what are the people and places and ideas represented? What is, what is Plato trying to say? Now, for some of you, you might have no clue whatsoever. And if you do, that's fine. Go look up the answers online. But try your own first. I'd rather get your own wrong opinion than have you go and do an intellectual copy paste job off some website. So, you know, if you give me anything that proves you watched it, you're getting full credit. I'd rather have your own opinion. If you're completely stumped, go online and look at the answers, okay? All right. Uh, I hope you enjoy the cave. It is very good. It's in delightful Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer-style claymation. 
and I think you will enjoy it. So I'm going to run this and then you will be done with the video, answer those questions, and you're done for the day, and I will see you on Tuesday. Okay? Arrivederci, children. Imagine prisoners that have spent their entire lives Oh, what was that all about? All right, looking forward to your responses. Uh, once again, if the video did not work, the audio on there, uh, I will have in your Schoology page underneath the link for this video, I'll link to that video directly on YouTube, okay? All right, take care, children.